Welcome to the Psychology Podcast, a platform where we discuss the mental, physical, and emotional health of your world. Welcome to where mind meets body. With your host, Kristen McAdams. Welcome to the Psychology Podcast, y'all. We are here in the studio today with Trevor Cavallo, my good friend, and I'm very happy to have him here. Um, before we get started, I will say that uh, if you're having a mental health emergency, call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. The number is listed at the end of the episode and in the episode description. Um, and this is not to be mistaken for uh, clinical advice. Uh, This is just a podcast about having constructive conversations about modern mental health topics with everyday people so that you can maybe be inspired to think about things a little bit differently through hearing other people's stories. That being said, welcome, Trevor. Hi. Hi. You want to introduce yourself and drop your five social media accounts? Yes. My name is Trevor Cavallo, and I'm an alcoholic. (laughs) You're safe here in, this, in these walls. Welcome Great the start. Great <laughs> start. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Trevor Kevelo, T-R-E-V as in Victor, O-R, Kevelo, K-E-V as in Victor, E-L-O-H. That's also my Twitter and Facebook. You can find my uh, recovery, journey, uh, recovery journey, men's mental health Instagram handle, which I started recently, which is Trevor on Trevor, <laughs> T-R-E-V-O-R on T-R-E-V-O-R, T-R-E-V-O-R, yeah. And then my backup account, which I just have just because Instagram fucked with me a couple of years ago. That's the Trevor Cavallo. So, yeah, Instagram then, does that. Yeah. And then, of course, my comedy, which is Corrupted Comedy with a K. Corrupted yes. with a K. Comedy with a C. Too many Ks is not good. <laughs> <laughs> we stop at one or two. Three. Eh. Three is too many. Three yeah. is too many. Yeah, we just stop right there. That's the one time it's like good things don't always come in threes. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah, that's the one. Ooh. That's the one time. And can I comment on uh, whoever that voice thing was that turned me on? a little bit oh yeah you like her you like her the intro voice she's just ai she's oh yeah i would like a date with her (laughs) (laughs) that's the future my friend so cannot wait i'll hook whoever up with the date with the ai voice i'll I'll get on the horn horn with her name i think it's with an a i i don't remember angelica i think it's probably oh i don't uh, know i'll get on the horn with uh zuckerberg we'll get that hooked up for you yeah there's the movie simone that was uh they like created an ai chick years ago with uh, pacino there's, ton- there's so many. I love those movies. And if you go back to the early 90s, a movie called Sherry 2000, which was a robotic chick that they had like robot women that they created and men could marry. Not to be confused with Johnny Five? No, not. It's always a woman. Did you notice that? Yeah. The AI like sex robot thing is always a woman. Like, yeah. Yeah. Why? But she was like nice too. She wasn't just like <laughs> hot that you can bang this robot. It was like she was like nice to him and like she was programmed to be like super like 50s like hi honey what you know I'm cooking dinner and then he was like making love to her and I'm like this is great. She didn't cry to manipulate people. (laughs) (laughs) Trevor and I I she eventually did. The best conversations I have with the guests on the show usually happen before the show even starts (laughs) and Trevor and I were talking about not only the physiological like health benefits of crying but also just like how people cry manipulate people (laughs) and uh, it was good it was good conversation yeah it was I bet that robot doesn't cry yeah (laughs) she was hot though I get it there's a there's a real fear of that now for a mental health therapist because a lot of people are like there's two camps one camp is like yeah, AI is never going to replace mental health because they just don't have the humanity. And the other camp is like, AI is absolutely going to replace mental health because yeah. it's going to be more accurate and effective. It's scary. It I don't scary. like anything, anything to do with AI. It's the scariest fucking thing that's happening. Yeah, well, and it's funny because, what, 20 years ago, like all the movies, like our generation growing up with yep. like iRobot and like mm-hmm. all these movies, and it's like we're just watching it happen. Yeah. Like, well, we They're quit. conditioning us. Yeah. 20 years ago, they're like, oh, yeah, well, give it 20 years and then we're going to do it. Yeah. Yeah, well, when I went to I happens. went to school at Boston University, and for a short time, I almost graduated from there. Well, that's another podcast episode. But they were telling us in that class, in the psychology class, that we would be giving therapy to robots someday. Not that the robots would be doing the therapy, but that we would be it's so creepy giving therapy to robots. And I'm like, I don't know if I can relate. You it's know? believable. 
Yeah, that's where we're headed. Can't yeah. wait. Yeah, we went from like, uh, was it Short Circuit with Johnny Five? Yeah. That's what I said. It was no Johnny Five. <laughs> yeah, I know. And then we went from that to like Ex Machina, which is like terrifying. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Within the course of like 15, 20 years. Yeah, you get your cute robot buddy to like the highly intelligent, smarter than you, can murder you when you sleep at any given moment. It all started with HAL 2000. Yeah, we wonder why mental health is on the <laughs> rise. Yeah. <Jesus. laughs> Everyone's so stressed <laughs> out. <laughs> But I think um, one of the big things is is today I want to talk about personal growth. Yes. Right? And I think uh, the AI is an interesting thing to, to kick that <laughs> off with because social constructs, I think, really muddle people's personal growth. Yeah. And it, I think it confuses us into, into like believing or not believing that we are capable of personal growth or what that growth journey can look like. So yeah. I want to talk to you about your experience in our threshold segment on your most recent personal growth journey. Uh, well, I, I think it really started, uh, I hit five years sober uh, this year, February 28th, and that's where I, I felt like before that I could talk about sobriety and recovery and what I went through. And I was open about it, very open, but I didn't really take the plunge into really trying to help people until it was just a personal thing that I had that, that kind of like foundation and weight of sobriety under me. Mm -hmm. So, I, cause How I know many years people, do you have? Five, uh, five, five years, four months five years plus okay. yeah, and some change. So I've seen people that were literally writing for like, like news sites that were less than a year sober talking about their, their journey. And I was like, mm, you're not even out of the woods really, you know, but that's, it's, I don't like to pass judgment, but at the same time I was like, how do you talking about, I mean, if you're talking about your, what's happening to you each day, I understand that's pretty cool, but it was like, you're, you're a year sober, like yeah. not even, it was like, she was like six, four or six months. And I was like, that's interesting. Like you're, you're getting stuff publicized. But I, I read a little bit. It was interesting. But for me, I felt like I couldn't, I didn't want to, uh, I wanted to make sure I was comfortable too. I wanted to check myself. It's kind of like uh, credentials. Like mm -hmm. I want to give myself five years of sobriety, then I can open up because it's yeah. like, you know, they say, uh, they say, what is it? Uh, relapsing is part of recovery. Yeah. You know, as a, as a, but I have, I've relapsed, but not in with drugs or alcohol. I've relapsed with emotions and sex mm -hmm. and, and love and stuff like that. So I called, I had an emotional relapse a few years ago with a girl I was like hanging out with and it was garbage, you know, <laughs> but I got really into her for no reason. And she was terrible for me. She drank, she smoked weed and she did coke. I was like, ah, why am I chasing this girl? Because she wanted me. She was into me, yeah. but she was into me for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. You know? So I was like, uh, so I, I, you know, once I dealt with that, I was like, that was a relapse to me. You know, I kind of like f went down this tunnel of, you know, of like chasing this person, you know, that's such an um, important concept, I think, because I think a lot of people don't realize that you can relapse over multiple things. I think, yeah. I think that <clears throat> that social construct piece makes us believe that, um, addiction recovery looks a specific way and that yeah. those words are like neurolinguistically linked to, yeah. Yeah. you know, a specific thing. And people have feelings about those words, right? So when they think relapse and they think addiction, they don't think about their own lives. They don't think about the ways that they might have their own cycles and patterns that they repeat that they may be addicted to. Yep. And a lot of that's driven by nervous systems. Like we've been talking about nervous yeah. system stuff, you know, Trevor, Trevor and I have, have many conversations on Instagram <laughs> yeah. here and there. She's yeah. just like staying connected, like with friends that throw memes at each other all day. It's great. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> but it's like, that's, you know, that's uh, it, social media being one of the, the conversation starters yeah. to ha really help change that dialogue. But I think the nervous system is part of the gener generator that yeah. sort of throws off that that cycle of whether or not you relapse. And we'll talk later in, in another section about um, just the stages of change and relapse being a part of it. Yeah, I'll and get into those that. stages of change mm. overlie um, addiction, but they're not they're not specific just yeah. to addiction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I uh, I think mine really. St I mean, where it kicked off, it started, it was like, kind of like, if you, you know, I'm a former jock, so football is my sport, but it's like, kickoff was February 28th, but when shit got real for me was May 12th, and that was, that, there was a, there's a whole, you know, that was, uh, I was back in my hometown, uh, right outside Chicago, and at a big show that night, 
And it was also Mother's Day weekend. The first Mother's Day without my mother. She passed away November 28th of last year. So, um, it was, and I was thinking about it, and then and a song came on, and it triggered me, and I started to cry. And then I was like, all right, I'll be fine. And then I started to cry again. And I played it again because I was testing myself, and I was like, what's going on, Trevor? So I played it again, and it just got worse. And I was like, uh oh. You got curious. That's oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got curious. I got very curious. That's super cool. <laughs> I was like, Ugh. And I was like, what's going on here? And then uh, I just started sobbing and weeping. And I was like, and I have, I have this term I use for myself. It's called just don't get stuck in the mud because you've got a big show tonight. And a lot of people are showing up and you got to be on your fucking game. You can't walk in there like half ass in her emotion. You got to be, you know. Reset. Yeah, exactly. So cried for about an hour. And I'm not talking like sniffles like, oh, it's a sad movie. I'm talking like. Dane Cook, uh, ugly, ugly cry. Yes. <laughs> like, I just, someone just kicked me in the balls for like an hour. That's how it felt. Yeah. And, and everything just started to like tighten up and I got loose. And I just sat there in my friend's kitchen where I was staying and I got it out. <clears throat> but that kicked off what I've been going through since. Yeah. Um, a lot of things happened uh, when I was back in Chicago. A lot. I was a fucking disaster. I was an emotional wreck. I could not. There was a time where I was just shaking and crying, like sh- literally shaking. And I would lay on my friend's couch and like just start bawling for no reason. There was something well, about the reason. initial. I mean, you went through the initial grief of that loss, right? Yes. Which is a huge loss for yeah. anybody. Yeah. Um, whether no matter what your relationship with your mom looks like, which I think is an important thing to note, because I think a lot of people struggle with that because everybody has different relationships yeah. with family members. Exactly. And you're going to go through something some grief process no matter what it looks like for you Mm -hmm. but the difference for you was that you didn't run away from that yeah feeling you know and i don't i don't know what maybe contributed to that Uh, for your ability to stick with it and get curious i know exactly what happened uh well i didn't grieve when she passed uh i took some time i cried a little bit i you know i look at my phone to go to call her or text her and i'm like man she's dead i was like i can't call her just to say what's up like my dad was different you know my dad died I think four years ago or something, four or five years ago, uh, end of the year. They actually died within a few days apart, but years apart. And right yeah. before their anniversary, it's all weird. But uh, it was, <clears throat> I never, like I said, I didn't really truly grieve it. And then all of a sudden, but I did that with my dad because it took me about six months to grieve my dad. Yeah. That's when it kicked in. Yeah. And my brother died right before my dad. So a few months before, so it was like wow. a double grieving. There's a lot going on. Yeah. So with my mom, it was that. And then <laughs> I ran into a, an, an ex. I didn't run into her. We, we hung out. We talked and stuff. And that triggered a lot of uh, unresolved emotions for me. A lot. Well, a lot of our relationships are representations of our relationship to our family. Yeah. And we don't realize that. We think that they're random. Yeah. And they're not. We're subconsciously drawn to choose partners that yeah. represent these like similar wounds. So it's, it's in, cause, and I think exes are like safer places to work out deeper emotions, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's why like relationships are so challenging because yeah. they're like, like we know, like Mike and I know, <laughs> know uh, to, uh, everything that we have to sit at the table and just be like, okay, we're not going to leave this table. We're going to figure it out, right? That's great. Because yeah. it's just triggering all, you know, a lot of, um, deeper more relevant stuff to us personally that is a safer place with a relationship like an ex interesting yeah yeah Yeah, it was uh i I could tell there is like some potential closure seeking on both of our parts because it's been like 10 years and uh that's cool that you both showed up for it yeah we did And, and she was very inquisitive on a lot of things and i've been blatantly honest uh for a long time now uh, even more now more now it's not just i'm honest i'm like very uh deep honest not just like oh yeah i did this Ugh. it was like no i did this because of this yeah you're this not admitting to things you're you're showing up with the reality of yes the it was reaction you know yeah. and she was asking all the right questions and i was like i said completely honest i asked her questions we hung out we talked we had a really good time we hung out a few times and it but something um something happened too i think it was I, you know i was talking to my niece about it who's you know she's younger and she's a little crazy, but she's also put together in this weird way. But she was like, you're in your, <laughs> she said, you're in your feminine energy because uh-huh. you're very yeah. emotional. Yeah. And I was like, you're right. And that was the other thing. I was like, I was, you know, I, I lost my mom. I don't have a relationship with my sister. My niece is probably the closest person to me who's 24. I have female friends that I'm close to, 
but I don't have an actual partner. And losing my mom, I was like, I lost the most important female in my life, which was my mother. Yeah. You know, so it was, uh, it was like, I was kind of like trying to hold on to someone or something, you know, uh, that was a, like I said, a feminine energy because I was like, that's what I needed. I needed to be, I needed someone to hug me and say, it's going to be okay. Yeah. And I didn't have that. Yeah. And nobody was doing that. My buddies were my homies, my guys, but like they're they didn't they're like what the fuck's wrong they're in their masculine energy yeah they needed the feminine energy to exactly. rebalance your masculine For real. energy yeah. yeah and then i became the feminine energy i got yeah. really fucking emotional you yeah. know it was just like my boobs grew no. <laughs> <laughs> i was like <laughs> a spotting i think that's what girls call it <laughs> before the period or pms but it, but i got really and i was like and i was like i there's something going on here and i need to work through it and i need to dig deep and I dug, and I dug, <laughs> and I got really. And then you're like, "Holy shit, it's deep down here." <laughs> yeah, and it it was like it took a. It's still going. Yeah, because now it's uh, it's not where it was before. Now it's part of my daily routine. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Now I. Yeah. That's huge because yeah. I. I try to explain this to people all the time, right? That when you're on a po- personal growth journey, it, people look at like, I'm, I'm going to therapy, I'm not going to therapy. Or yeah. I'm, um, I'm in my meditation practice or I'm not in my meditation practice. They, they look at it like going to the gym, but it's like, yeah. you know, if you're using the gym analogy, going to the gym every day is the only thing that creates any sort of long-term consistency and yep. health like over time. Yeah. And emotional processing is the same way. Once you learn how to dig like that mm-hmm. and not run away from yourself and tolerate the feelings that are coming up. Yeah you can do it a lot faster. Like that, that self-awareness lends itself to that moment to moment processing. Like every minute of every day, it becomes very, um, just part of your life. And people are always like, Oh, I'm on a healing journey. It's like, yeah, like you can be on a healing journey. You don't have to be healing 24 seven, but if that's a regular part of your routine and that's a regular part of what you do to take care of yourself, then life becomes way, it becomes way more, like deep and and connected and alive and also easier at the same time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I um, <clears throat> since May twelfth, today was the first. But the day's still young. Uh, I haven't cried. So uh, my my daily routine now is I wake up pretty early, between six and seven. I have coffee and then I uh, my niece was so like, "Do you do yoga?" I was like, "No, I just lay down and I stretch." Because yep. I just need to, str- but I also I'm doing breathing techniques. Which someone's like, oh, it's like yoga. I'm like, eh, whatever. I don't know. But I lay down. Uh, how I lay is like basically, you know, it's, I, I look like I'm praying because I am. Yeah, I'm praying. But I tell people I don't pray to like, like uh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I pray to the universe, to God, to whatever yeah. it is, and I pray to myself. Yeah, because I'm like talking to myself, like you're gonna be okay. I love you, dude. You know, you're going to make mistakes, continue to make mistakes, just a lot less. And when you make mistakes, you're going to catch it and you're going to fix it. Yep. Or before it was just like, whatever, or I'm only, I'm human or I do that. It's like, no, like be conscious of what you're doing, what you're saying and know that there's consequences if you do or say something fucked up or try to hurt somebody, which, you know, I don't do anymore. Um, But it's, like I said, it's part of my daily routine. It's gratitudes, you know, being grateful to be alive, grateful to be sober and grateful to be present. That's the other thing that I really started to to embrace is being present in every moment as that I can. And I'm not like walking around like I'm some sort of like, you know, nirvana. Uh, uh, fuck that. No. Well, that's a whole you know? nother form of spiritual bypassing, uh, right? That's yeah. like, that's like putting yourself into the, like, again, one of those states, right? But yeah. what you're talking about is actual healing. Yeah. I, I literally, but that was my thing was I get in an uncomfortable position mm-hmm. physically. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. But I'm also physically I'm stretching too. I start with breathing. Usually that's when I, after some breathing, that's when I start to cry. Yeah. A little bit, it comes out and I'm like, I'm pulling that out because I basically haven't cried for 45 years. Uh, cause that's how old I am. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to you cry. Like it's stored. I got to let it out. <laughs> yeah. My dad didn't allow us to cry. Yeah. As my dad was beating the shit out of us, he was telling us not to cry. So you have that very, very typical toxic masculinity oh, background beyond my dad yeah. was a German immigrant and grew up during world war two. So we did different, Talking all my Germans, friends, man. Yeah. My friends were like normal suburbanites <laughs> That's why I get along with like Mexicans. Yeah, I do too. Yeah, yeah cuz they're like they're like, "Oh, your dad kicked the shit out of you." I was yeah. like, "No, he didn't spank me. He fucked me up." Yeah. You know. And yeah. they're like, "Oh, my dad did too." I was like, "Cool, we could be friends." Yeah. Trevor you know? and I also have this odd bond of like both being German but raised Italian. Uh, I was raised 
I wasn't raised Italian, but I was. I hung out with Italians. Yeah, Chicago, Chicago. So you were Chicago. raised Italian. It's the yeah. same thing. Yeah, like all my friends were. Hey, you doing? Yeah. and I'm like, dude, you're German. Yeah, I still do it. <laughs> I dress like a. I dress like a dago half the time. <laughs> They're like, what is it? What is it? The fucking tracksuit. I call that a European. Uh, what is that? A European tuxedo <laughs> is the tracksuit. <laughs> Because it works yeah. for all of them. Yep. You know, Mideasterns, Armenians, which they don't have out here. They got a million of them in L.A. Uh, Polish, German, I know Italians. They yep. all wear the fucking yep. tracks. I have two in my closet. Yeah. <laughs> I've got four tops. Yeah. <laughs> I went a little crazy in Chicago when I was there. I was like, I just want more of these. It's even better when they're velvet. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I had a velvet tracksuit my brother sent me years ago when i was yeah. when i was still doing drugs yeah and he sent me a necklace that had a razor on it <laughs> it is always associated with drugs too it <laughs> very much is my best friend sent me a meme the other day that was like uh, if you didn't date a drug dealer in the in the mid 2000s then you weren't like a millennial or yeah like something like that I was like, Jesus. it's accurate yeah it's that's accurate. spot on <laughs> yeah <laughs> but anyways back to you crying every day <laughs> yeah so today is the first day i'm out of the woods but what started with how it started was I was uh, I just I I don't know what happened I just I did this on my own I was like something's going on with me and I need to fix it or get through it or identify it whatever I didn't have a book I didn't talk to anyone I just started like I just laid down one day and I just in that uncomfortable position I go I need to get really uncomfortable physically to stimulate the emotional mental all the i call them the elise physically mentally emotionally psychologically i like that yeah Yeah. so i had to like (laughs) i was trying to find a way to combine those like all of those things yeah (laughs) i was like i gotta get really uncomfortable for this to work so i got in this position and i was like and then i just started sobbing and then i was violently shaking for an hour yeah and they call that uh TRE meditation. Yeah. Which is ironic because that's my nickname, Trey. Yeah. <laughs> like, I was like, yeah. built for this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was like, I literally had no idea. I'm like, why is this happening? I felt like I was vomiting for an hour. Yeah. Dry completing, heaving. completing stress cycles. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, and then after the second or third day, I'm like, I kind of like that. <laughs> I was like, this is my new addiction. Yeah. Well, like, it, but it also, it, when it resets your nervous system, it, it allows your parasympathetic nervous system to come on board. So you feel more relaxed. And I tell people all the time, people are always like, oh, I want to be happy. I'm like, I don't think you want to be happy. Mm-hmm. I think you want to be calm. Yes. And that's yeah. that allows you to be calm because otherwise, like, you were walking around with all that tension. Oh, yeah. Right? Like, and you're just carrying that around and it yeah. stores in your muscles. And then people are like, oh, I'm I'm not aging well because yeah. everything's tight. Like, I can't, you know, I walk it, with a limp now. And yeah. it's like, well, maybe you should do exactly, like, the practice that you're talking about. Yeah. Because that... Those, your emotions come from somewhere. Yeah. Right. And if you're not having access to them, then you're not accessing those parts of your body either. Yeah. You're not accessing your nervous system. And with the thing that you're stretching in the morning is your nervous system. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like you have to bring it online and bring it on board to yeah. really be attuned with what's coming up for you yeah. in your body. Yeah. I was, I was like, even in, you know, it, I was walking around where I was, my emotions were about eight and a half out of 10. Mm-hmm. like in public and i was like i went to a starbucks and i sat there and then it's just like something like something triggered it was like my hometown my home my old neighborhood and it's like something triggered and i was just like the tear and i was like the sunglasses wrong thing kind of, but the tears started to go down I'm like i gotta get out of here like I, maybe i'm not good in public you know <laughs> i was like i need to go hide and I end up going to a meeting an aa meeting okay and i've never gone to one in my hometown so i went to i found a meeting i've got the app and I went to a meeting and uh, uh, I was a fucking wreck. But I got my, that's where I got my five year chip. And, yeah. And I there, saw your post yeah. On that. yeah. I was, that was awesome. I was hesitant about getting it. And then a friend of mine was like, why? Because I was like, I don't really do AA. I don't do the steps. And then I actually looked at the steps because I haven't looked at them in years. And I looked, I'm like, I've done almost all the steps. I just do it Trevor's way, which is like zigzag. Yeah. It's not like one, two, three. It's like, yep. You Tarantino the steps. <laughs> Tarant- yes. That's great. I Tarantino the steps. It's like, what's going on here? You well, know? and there's a huge group of people that would probably take offense to that, right? Oh, yeah. Like the huge, like the, the, the 12 steppers yeah. would be like, that's not how you do it. And you got to do it this Mostly, way. But that becomes an, an addiction in and of itself, yeah, it right? Does, like yeah. that, that organized religious aspect of but AA. That's, that was my problem with it was it's not religious, but it is. It has the yeah. religious mentality. It's like, you have to do these steps. You have to do this. You have to follow this. You yeah. ha- and I'm like, what? And for some people that works great. That's what they exactly. need. But 
for a lot of people, it's not what they need. And yeah. when society proposes you with only two options, either get sober with AA or don't get sober. Totally unfair. That's, yeah, completely it's, unfair. It's a recipe it's, for disaster and failure. Absolutely. You know, and, there's other things, other ways to do things. I mean, I openly talk about microdosing mushrooms. I'm yeah. not hiding that at all. Um, I don't abuse it because I knew if I did, I'd stop. Like yeah. I ha- I'm, I'm cognitive enough to know if I'm abusing something, whatever it is. It could be food sex love whatever it's like oh this is getting out of hand now i'm cognitive enough and if you're attuned with your body the way that you've been describing Mm -hmm. right you know when that you know what that gauge is right like you start to feel a certain way right and then you're like oh yeah yeah that was that was was it emotionally recently uh a physical thing recently and it, it didn't go uh as well as I thought it would go. It fell outside of the spectrum that you know how to, how to the range you know how to it just, I just, function in. Uh, let's put it this way. I rounded the bases, but it was like the old Canseco where Pop hit his head. Yeah. It was the most lackluster performance of all time. Yeah. And it was like, there's something going on with me. Because yeah. I have no problem physically things working so and if there's shame that comes up rather than like i imagine there's some shame involved with whatever the experience was yeah. then and rather than having that shame take over which is i think what a lot of people do which also kicks off an addictive cycle yeah rather than having the shame you know take over and then you self-sabotage or self-abuse because yeah. of that shame if you can hear it and you go oh i didn't like that i just did that yeah. right or i didn't like that that just happened then yeah. you can course correct it was yeah yeah and it was interesting because i've i've and i'll be brutally honest like uh i stopped watching porn yeah like i use it when i need it but i don't watch it yeah um i unfollowed all the instagram models that are just like half naked yeah i still have friends that send me my best friends are like do you want me to stop sending go yeah i go i just and i and it's not like i'm this like male feminist bullshit i go i'm just it's it's clouded me. I had a massive porn addiction for a long time, and I realized it just recently. I was like, oh, because I'd like – and I go to like a masseuse and get a hand job, a happy yeah. ending, or it was actually midway, so it was a happy halftime. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that place in North Hollywood is fucking great. <laughs> Halfway through it, and then they finished the massage. It's awesome because I actually get the massage because I yeah. enjoy it. But yeah. I was like, this is – but what I would do is like, oh, now I need a girlfriend. I'm like – what the fuck? Like, dude, that's not what women are for. And I'm not like, uh, I was like, I was like, oh, now I don't need a girl. I need to go. Do, I was like, no, that's not what women are for is to make you nut. Like you do that in your own. Yep. It was like taking the place yep. porn and just swiping right on Bumble and getting a, you know, a hand job every four to six weeks. Yep. I was like, oh, I don't need a girl now. I'm like, I was like, Trevor, that, that was like me talking to me, like, what are you You're talking like, oh, about? Oh, no, dude? committed, connected relationships yeah. are about intimacy and which partnership is, and yes, friendship. And, which is, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, truly, I truly yearn that if, with a woman. Like, yeah. I had that one that, like, I was connected on a level I can't explain. Yeah. And I'll never be able to explain, and I'm okay with that, but it's gone, yeah. you know, and that's the one we where we reconnected recently, but, you know. I fucked that up, so because that's what I do. But sometimes those people come into your life so you can figure out what you are yeah. missing. Her, <laughs> I mean, it's true, but I do, you know. But it's that connection, right? Yeah. It's that level of connection. It's, it's it's the thing that you know, not to get like you know crystally, but it's like that. Like they talk about like twin flame theory and all that, but it's yeah. more a connection you can't explain. Yeah, like I can't explain it to people. My you know, my buddy asked me about you know the. Well, what's the best sex you had or this or that i was like sex or intimacy yeah and he's like and i'm like sex this girl and he's, i'm like intimacy this girl he's like how her i go i don't know yeah i go our soul connected yeah i go and that's it and that's just there's a lot of debate around that like people talk about like what's the difference between love and chemistry and like there's a certain kind of chemistry that yeah. people are drawn to and that's a chemical chemistry mm-hmm. and um but we don't actually know, right? Like we don't yeah. know, like we can, we can study the hormones and the pheromones and we can study all these things oh, and yeah. we can study patterns and relationships and whether or not they, how they work out, you know, at the yeah. end. But I don't think we can really boil down with any sort of reasonable, you know, yeah. uh, confidence that that kind of chemical chemistry versus love are, are two distinct things. Like yeah. I think that, those type of people that that type of connection they I, they do come into our lives for a reason but yeah. they they speak to those parts of ourselves that we were talking about before like those 
long-term, more deeper, you know, subconscious needs yeah. that developed when we were younger in some way. And they represent, like, if you can heal that wound, like, and make that relationship work, like, that's yeah. what healthy relationships do. They they heal those wounds. Yeah. And there's something about those those chemical relationships that either represent the wound and validate it, spin yeah. it out even further, yeah. or if you have the awareness that you've been practicing, you can really learn from, you can really take. Yeah, and that's where I'm at now. I'm out of the woods with it, with with the emotional part. Now it's more the, I don't want to, I, I, I'm going to say analytical because I'm like looking at it differently. I'm not yeah. so like vulnerable and emotional. Now I'm like, what's really happening or what's happened? And it's like, is this part of the process of, of grieving something that's gone, the actual relationship? Yeah. Or is this hanging on because I have nothing else? Or is this like... Something rooted in a fear? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm working through it, you know. And, then, you know, I, it's tough when <laughs> I'm playing catch alone. Yeah. You know, and yeah. it's like I'm, I'm not getting a... You know, I've, I've been smart about, about how I uh, reapproach the situation. But it's uh, it was just so much happened at once. It mm-hmm. was like, because it was like crying about my mom, then crying about my dad, then crying about my brother, then crying about my ex, then crying about me. Then I was just like, you're completing all these cycles. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was an overload. Yeah, it was like it all decided to show up at one time rather than spread out. It yeah, was like yeah. And I mean, I'm, when I say down for the count, like I was like, like out. Like I cried myself to sleep. I don't know how many nights. Yeah. My friends like I was like, no, nah, I'm not kidding. They're like the fuck's wrong with you dude and i was just like hey, welcome to sobriety and recovery yeah you're like, like I, i'm releasing all my trauma this yeah, is what it looks like it's not pretty <laughs> yeah i don't get to smoke it away drink it away or snort yeah. it away anymore i was like i got to deal with it every fucking moment now well and that's such know? a big question too because i think that you know what talking about the difference between aa versus other types of recovery and people recovering in their own ways i think the point of all of that is that you probably wouldn't process these things in the same way if you were to continue to lean on those substances yeah because those There's substances no would have. shut down that yeah. connection to that exactly system and i mean when i drank i would there were there were times where i get wasted or pretty drunk and i just cry yeah. about something yeah. you know whatever it was a girl or my dad or like my childhood or something or you know whatever it was but it wasn't i wasn't a crier it wasn't often but it would happen uh, but Almost like was, the substance was the thing that got you to yes, express the exactly. emotion. Yeah. Yes, it was the, the yeah. lubricant. Yeah. yeah, I can't cry unless I'm drunk. Yeah, yeah. And now it's like, like it, it when I get done because I know that you know when you cry it, it releases uh, uh, chemicals. Yeah, like po- hormones. That po- yeah, that are actually positive. Mm-hmm. And somebody was just like, when I was crying a lot, they're like, "Man, you look really good." And I'm like. <laughs> Because I'm crying every morning. Because I released all the I feelings. Like, I like, I like, like, there's a podcast I did in LA a few weeks ago. I was like bright red. Yep. I was like, what the fuck, dude? Like, would you go to the tanning booth? <laughs> <laughs> nope. It's my crying. glow up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, that's what it looked like. I was like, no, I yeah. was like, I was in a, like, I called it a retreat. I was in this, uh, this place in the hills for 15 days, the oh, Hollywood cool. Hills up in okay. the Laurel Canyon. And I treated myself because it was, it was the ending the year on the road and I needed to be alone. Yeah. You know, I was in that, when I was in Chicago for that five or six weeks, I was with my friend and I wasn't alone ever. Oh, I was alone during the day, but you know, um, I just needed yeah. that space to be completely alone. Yeah. Like nonstop. So it was you know, Aaron Rodgers. It yeah. <laughs> have a dark retreat. Uh, <laughs> no, I did actually. I microdosed every did, morning. Did you? It was the first thing I did. I did took, you do a no lights thing where you just walked around in the dark for three days or no, no, I, I, it was like I wake up about six, and I would take a mushroom around six fifteen, six thirty, and then I wait for it to kick in, yeah. and I would let it process through me. And then I have a bunch of like video or uh, audio like journals. I audio okay. journaled because oh, cool. it was easier for me because I was like, you know, so so much was going on. One time it took four hours. I was on the the <laughs> the ride for four hours. Yeah, and a lot of emotions, laughing hysterically, like I was, you know, like a little kid farting in the in the bathtub, <laughs> and then like all of a sudden I'm crying. Yeah, I was like, what is going? And I was just like, and I'm like, I need this. Yep, and it got me to places that I needed to be, realign things. And somebody was like, dude, you're not supposed to microdose every day today. I was like, I don't care. Yeah, I, I'm fixing myself. You're like I am for this time. I'm not partying. That they don't like people that don't understand about that process and that journey. I'm like, this isn't a party. This is yeah. reconnecting with myself, my higher power, and just feeling better 
by feeling more open and emotional. And well, vulnerable. you're not doing it to change your state. You're not doing yes. it to avoid something. You're it's doing the opposite. it to connect to something. Yes, yeah. exactly. Thank you. It's yeah. re- like I said, yeah. reconnecting with myself. Yeah. And it was like, holy very different. Shit. Yeah. And I was like, ate very lean. I worked out every day. I stretched. I did my, you know, like I said, my morning routine, all this stuff. I had a great system and I set that in place and now I'm continuing to do it. Yeah. So that's part of my daily routine in the morning. Well, this is what I try to tell people all the time. Like for for many years now, they've talked about the mind body connection, mm-hmm. and I don't even like that phrasing because it makes it sound like it's like this bi directional, like two fold relationship. Yeah. And it's not. It's your one one unit. It's one whole system. So your feelings Absolutely. are coming from the cells in your body. They're coming from those neurological connections. And if yeah. you're repeating and practicing the same thing every day, it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. It's going to wire. Yeah. It's going to validate itself. So. Yeah. It takes a lot of courage and effort to change those patterns, but it comes from getting to know your own mind, right? It's not just changing the habit, but that's a place to start. A lot of people are like, oh, let's just change the habit and and then I'll be, but you're not your habits, right? Like you're the thing below that. Your habits are the result of the the aspect of your mind that that we lose access to because we're distracted by social constructs, because we're distracted by all these things. Yeah, that's, that's... Fuck, that's right on. <laughs> <laughs> and when I when I was doing my, I call it the prison workout because it was, I could do it in like a four by yeah. four space. Yeah, and it was, but it was uh, the intention I put behind it. Yeah, it wasn't just like yes. all right, you know, work out, do this. Do, do, do. It was just like breathe, do this, do this, do this. And I was like, everything had like my mind was there. I was yeah. totally present with each thing I was doing and every movement. Yeah, and I would stop, reset if I had to. Yeah. And then I started listening to like, I call it my self help video, which is Arnold's Six Steps of Success. Nice. <laughs> which is like only four and a half minutes long. I love it. So I played it for like a half hour and just listened to it over and over. Yeah. And it's like, and I, I, I have this old thing where since I was a teenager, I said, I only take advice from people at a level I want to be. Mm-hmm. So if I want to be, you know, uh, Bill Burr, yeah. I'm going to take advice from Bill Burr. Yeah. I want to be at his level, I take advice from him. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if, Well, that's where wrestling with shame comes in, because if you're able to wrestle with shame, then you're able to be humble and put yourself around people that are doing it better than you. Yeah. And I like that people are sharing like social media is is a place to go to to have that connection because you get to see people that are doing a good job at the thing that you want to get good at. Yes. And that's so important to be to be able to show up as a student in that space and just learn from other people that have already done it. Yeah. Um, I think there's also something to be said, like sharing a story like this today, Mm -hmm. uh, people going through the journey themselves. Yeah. Because I think we attach too quickly and too, uh, we're too focused on somebody that's already had it done. Like, Mm, like, Oh, I already accomplished this goal. I have 10 years of sobriety. Okay. I'm only going to learn from them. It's like, okay, well that's where the one year of sobriety comes in. You listen to like what that first year was like. And then you listen to the people that are going through the journey. Yeah. You know, so there's going to be a balance there too, I think. Yeah. There in, in those meetings I've been to there, there's, uh, people that are, you know, newer, you know, and then the old timers. And the cool thing is it's like, when you go there, it's like you're every time I've gone to a meeting and I've been to plenty of like, you know, three or four different states now, you always learn something. Yeah. No matter where, yeah. what level they're at. It could be their first day. It could be their, you if know, if you're not self year. consumed with yes. your own mind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's something that I had to get over is like, there was times where I was hesitant to, to share or whatever. And I had decided to, and I was like, I'm not sharing for me. I'm sharing to help them. Yeah. I mean, the last meeting I went to was different cause I was a wreck and I had to get it out. I was like literally shaking and crying at the same time. Yeah. And there's people that were, I think uncomfortable in the room. Cause they're like, this dude looks like, you know, <laughs> doesn't look like this is this thing they were like ew feelings yeah this guy yeah this guy looks like he you know i don't know whatever i look like but he it looks was, dangerous yeah he's emotionally yeah, unstable i, I, I shade i showed up in all black too you yeah. Know? yeah and it was like you know but it was it was a wreck and i yeah. needed it and i'm so glad i went and I, I connected with some people yeah uh from you know from from my hometown and i was like oh we had mutual friends and it was it was obviously it was, it was positive but it was like I needed that, and I was like, "Okay, I can, I can take this chair out. I can accept it because I did the step work on my own in my own weird way. Yeah. I am sober. Yeah, that's the other thing. Yeah. it's like the only thing about being in those groups, those rooms, is the only uh, was it like commit thing. The only be- the reason I forgot what it's called, but the only does if you." <laughs> 
<laughs> it's like community and, to me. Like, yeah. that's what I really think it is. It's going say, to those rooms. Like, the only thing you have to do is want to be sober. Yeah. You, there's not like a booklet and you have to fill out forms. And it's right. like, you don't have to apply. Yeah. Your only, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Your only commitment is you want to stay sober. That's yeah. it. Yeah. So it's like, oh, I, I had to like reassure myself because I was so uh, almost like guilty that I wasn't like. It becomes perfectionistic. Doing, yeah. Doing the stunt work and doing this. And I don't have sponsors. I was like, I do have sponsors and sponsees. Yeah. There's people I talk to that I need help with. Yeah. You know, and I have people in, in you know recovery that do the step work and everything they're like if you need me call me yeah you know and i was like all right cool and i I have and then there's people that are um, i'm helping you know i'm openly now very openly encouraging people to come to me if they need help with anything yeah but my my personal boundary is i'll help you as long as it's a lifestyle change and not just like oh i'm not feeling good today i think i want to quit for a while right i'm like I'll help you, but I'm not going to invest too much into you. And it's a boundary. So it's just a boundary. I think it's important to talk about the stages of change. So let's mm-hmm. head over to that approach section and we'll talk about some research Ooh. about change. Okay. Should talk about some education around change. Now, one thing I think is really interesting these days is that people are very into mental health. So they're learning a lot about mental health, different uh, resources and tools and diagnosis. The problem is that most of society is going through that most therapists go through Mm -hmm. is that they self diagnose. So like when you become a therapist and you're learning about all these different things, you diagnose yourself with everything. I think part of that process is about trying to figure out how to relate to people that have those diagnoses, but also it's a fear of like, okay, how do I show up in a room? Like if I'm a therapist, am I stable? Am I sane? Right. And I'm watching society go through the same thing. And I think it's like what you had asked. You're like, have you ever heard of exposure therapy? I think I'm doing exposure therapy on myself. And it's like that aspect. Like a lot of people like, I think I have ADHD. I think I'm autistic. I think I'm these things. Everyone's autistic now. Yeah. (laughs) yeah. It's an evolution. It's not a disorder. It's just part of our brains evolving, I think. But what's interesting is that there's these, these, theories and topics and and research um information on research and all these things that exist um that have existed you know for many years now in psychology that people are now grasping and one of the things that i don't hear discussed a lot is the stages of change Mm -hmm. and the stages of change have been around for a really long time um and they are pre-contemplation contemplation contemplation, preparation um action and maintenance Mm. and relapse is the last one Right. And so this used to come up a lot in the addiction world when I worked in addictions, because Mm -hmm. we always wanted to know what stage of change people were in. Okay, And you can kind of enter and exit the stages at any point in time. Yeah. And you can sort of move through them and like you can get stuck at certain stages and things like that. And I think a lot of like what you've talked about in your own experience is really highlighting those stages, right? Like times where you've been like pre-contemplation is more like I need a change, but I don't know I need a change. Yeah. And then contemplation is like considering, okay, I think I need to change. It's like that day. If if we're talking about addiction specifically, right. It's like that one day that you're super hungover and you're like throwing up or whatever. And you're just like, okay, I think this isn't good. Like you've hit rock bottom. And I think that's a hard thing because a lot of people make change from that place. They make change from like, Oh, I got a, medical diagnosis or I've I've come down with an illness or I've had a major life event happen and that's the thing that shakes them into the change rather than having a more like personal growth mindset. And the other piece to this is that another piece of research that I looked up was personal growth. I was like, I wonder what the research even looks like on personal growth. Mm. Like how do you study personal growth? And there is a personal growth inventory. Mm. Um, it's called the personal grow. Yeah. Right. In- inventory. No, I think it's like initiative. I don't know, but it's, a, it's called the PGI. It's been around since, uh, the, I think the nineties and recently in the mid two thousands, they've added more, um, like culturally inclusive, the try and test rely- reliability and valid- validity, um, which for listeners, I think is an important thing when we're talking about research is reliability and val- validity of research. What they're saying is that, the measure that you're using to study something is consistently producing the same results around the thing that you're measuring and it actually measures the thing that you're measuring, right? So if you Mm -hmm. have an inventory that's personal growth, it's saying that does this consistently and reliably measure personal growth, Yeah. right? So does it it consistently do it? Does it 
show those results over time and is it actually measuring growth? Yeah. So I think that's interesting because a lot of people, I think, don't tap it. They, they look at like, what's wrong with me? Yeah. Right. The disorder yes. part, right? Yeah. Like, am I autistic? Do I have ADHD? But yeah. they don't look at measures like personal growth. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I, I can see that. I, that's where I'm at. Kind of when it's, when I started my thing, I was like, is this a phase? Like, is it, am I going to get out of this? At first it was like, I know that I'll get out of this. I'll get, you know, I'll get out of the mud. Like I was saying, I use for myself. I just didn't know when or how. Mm-hmm. I was like, "How long is this going to be? Is this going to be a month, two months, three months? Am I going to be like this in a year?" Am I fooling myself? Yeah. And then, <laughs> then I was like, I read a lot of, listened to a lot of self help stuff. A lot of Alan Watts. I mm-hmm. was listening to him. Yep. Jordan Peterson, which some people have an issue with because he's very outspoken against the woke culture. Yep. Um, but I love what I love his theories on the shadow. Yep. Big fan of shadow if work. If you read his actual research, if you if you people that have a problem with Jordan Peterson have a problem with Jordan Peterson strictly for political bias issues. Yeah, that's it. They don't know yeah. who he is or what he's done. You know, f- from for from a psychological perspective from the f- field of psychology. Yeah. And if you look at the research talking about reliability and validity, mm-hmm. I don't know why it's so hard to say that word. Um, but if you look at that, yeah. You can actually see that the things that he talks about have in the way he feels is based on a global research yes. base. It's yeah. not just an opinion and yeah. a feeling that he's basing it off of like most other people are. Yeah, it's not like he was sitting in his dorm room in Canada and he's like, Hey, I have an idea. He he's actually, like, I have a feeling and yeah. I feel like yeah, yeah it's not he put that. in the work and the yeah. study. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Like, for many, many years. And and that's something that kind of brought kind of brought me to a different level was I was like, I can't get too like, like I said, kind of nirvana and soft and floating all that shit. Yeah. I was, you know, he made a really good point. He said people, he goes martial artists are the, are the perfect example or candidates of somebody that keeps their shadow close to them, but at bay, Yeah, like a black belt. It's like, I'm not going to go try and start fights, but if th- something happens or some, some, they see someone like a fight breakout or, you know, someone gets attacked. They know what to do. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's the smartest fucking thing I've heard in a long time is yeah. always have like kind of like having a gun and where you need to have a gun. Yeah. You know, it goes you, back- go out, you know, hunting or camping in like the real wilderness, carry a gun. Yeah. You just don't know. It go. It, it's the other part of when I say people don't want to be happy, they want to be calm. Yeah. The second part to that is, and they want to be able to respond to a real world threat yeah. and know they can respond to it. Yep. So if you, and, and a lot of today we've skewed the baseline of what we consider to be a threat, mm-hmm. which is a problem, right? Like yeah. major threats are like loss of a loved one, mm-hmm. you know, natural disaster, um, you know, at loss of access to resources. Like there yeah. are like major threats that will that will deteriorate your or threaten your quality of life or, or threaten your life mm-hmm. just in general. Yeah. And we've skewed that line. So we are now having big reactions to small threats and yeah. that's making us feel dysregulated because yeah. your body needs to be able to effectively respond to a threat and you need to know how it responds to that threat. Yeah. And that's what allows you to be calm. Yeah. Because then you're not you're not you know getting stressed about sending an email or getting stressed about a fight with a friend or yeah. whether or not you fit into society or whether or not you know your body image matches the model like you don't yeah. get consumed with those things because you realize those things are going to kill you yeah they're just yeah it's it's you know, that's also the the whole what is it um you know self doubt and and insecurities you know and I'm I'm getting I'm I'm. I'm getting better with it, you know, my insecurities, you know, comedy is, is really is what kicked it off. It's just like, take my insecurities and use it for me. Yeah. Like, you know, like called self shitting on your stage. Yeah. You know, self shitting, self deprecation, but self shitting. It's yeah. like that. I used to be really into that. That's when I was drinking and using. Then I got sober. Then I was like, oh, and then I got smarter yeah. and I was like more present and more coherent. And I'm like, oh, I can not just just shit on myself, but I can kind of make fun of myself, but not being so awful to myself. Yep. And that was a representation of how I really felt about myself. Well, people today talk about like authenticity and like love is love is a big pride month thing and all of these terms. And when you're, when we're talking about those things, like it's portrayed socially as just being like, well, I'm going to like dress really nice and and take a really good selfie and like put myself out there and be proud of myself. But that doesn't, 
speak to actual authenticity. That doesn't yeah. speak to actual wrestling with your insecurities because if you if if love is love and you love yourself, yeah, you got to like yourself for all the things you don't like about yourself which, too. Like, and you need to be able to face those directly without running from them. Which is where my shitter selfie stem from. Yeah, there's there's a lot behind that. Yeah, I mean, and in the toilet. <laughs> hey. yep. there there is yeah there's a there people have asked about it and i'm like there's a lot to that yeah it's not just like a guy taking a shit in the morning right there's a lot to that yeah there's I'm, a whole purpose intention wh- when i'm doing that most people are the most vulnerable when they're on the toilet yeah because their their pants are down yeah their pants you know around their ankles or whatever so they physically are like kind of stuck yep um, it's like the last sacred place we yeah. have in society. Everyone's like, we'll walk around naked, but I will not take a shit. In front yeah. Of you. <laughs> and I do it. Uh, it's because I usually get it in the morning. So I'm like, you know, out of bed. I've got bags on my eyes or my hair's a mess or I just look like shit. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm totally vulnerable. Yeah. I'm, I'm showing people that you can be completely vulnerable because they look at social media and everyone's done up good and filtered and yeah. all this stuff going on. And I'm like, no. Yeah. I'm completely vulnerable. And I, I'm a son of a plumber, so, you know. I love that. The, the, <laughs> the, What's wild, too, yeah. is that people don't respond to that level of authenticity. They don't respond to messy. Yeah. They respond to the, like, going back to that idea of, like, modeling the people that have already done it. Yeah. You know, like, people really like the polished, more aesthetically pleasing look, and that's what they'll follow, and that's what they'll like. And yeah. it's, like, it's interesting that you bring up the porn addiction piece. That's a huge thing that people are addressing these days, yeah. which I love, because it's so... There's so much shame for people in that and it gets yeah. really like pushed under the radar and people won't even get Instagram accounts because they get bombarded by all these aesthetically pleasing photos it's and it pulls into that dopamine boost. And it's it, obnoxious. Yeah. And people like if you can find accounts like that, like, yeah. like what you're doing with the shitter selfies, yeah. right? <laughs> like more it, of those. Yeah. You need more yeah. stuff like that. You need more people just being themselves and, and yeah. not it. Social media is always going to be a highlight reel, but yeah. But you can show other other highlights. You can highlight yeah. other areas of your life and really sh- demonstrate authenticity yeah. in, a, in a different way. Yeah. When I was doing uh, most of the, the the Instagram lives I did with Trevor and Trevor were I was my hair was mess. I was like whatever because I want to show people it's okay. Yeah. yeah. It's okay to look like shit and be you know you know be be because I felt also more vulnerable. Yeah. And more honest when I just looked like I didn't comb my hair yet or brush my even brush my teeth. I yeah. was just like, I'm just gonna do this. Yep. I don't I wanna show people that it's you can just be completely okay and and like show yourself. It's okay. You don't have to like spend four hours getting ready so you know, it's like I was like, No, I, I went I I just go the opposite way. I really feel no, like that, that vulnerability stage of healing is that action stage too. Like if you're yeah. talking about stages of change, right? Yeah. Like vulnerability is that action stage because it's that moment when you're like, okay, I've contemplated enough. Yeah. Right. I've thought about it. I've thought it over. It's like your first couple of years of sobriety, right? Yeah. I've thought it over. I've thought it over. Mm-hmm. Now I'm just going to do the work. I'm going to yeah. do the thing. Yeah. Right. I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to go, you know, take some time to myself. I'm going to cry. I'm going to sh- I'm going to do these things. Yeah. Like that's action. Yep. And then that other phase after, no, I shouldn't even say phase, right? But that other integration mm-hmm. after is the maintenance when you're really checking in with yourself every day because you're used to doing that. That's kind of where I'm at now. Yeah. Yeah. That maintenance I, phase. The the daily routines of, of meditating, praying in the morning and all that. And then like getting a cry out if it's there today, like is that first time I was like, I was also tired and the <laughs> staying with my knees and her animals were a little, a little clingy. <laughs> and I was just like, Oh, this fucking petting zoo. Needs yeah. What's up with the animals uh, being clingy there? The studio uh, dogs are like all uh, over you today. I don't know. That may be a good thing, you know? <laughs> They're like, he's vulnerable. We yeah. Like like, him. Oh, he's yeah, safe. He's yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like, but I got it done and I was, and my body, like it was, it was a little tight today. So instead of working out, I just swam for a half hour. Yes. Like actually it. swam, not yep. just like played in the pool. Yeah. Like no, in the morning. Did I, laps. Yeah. Yep. Did laps and did all my stuff and I felt better. Then I dried off and I was like, all right, cool. Yep. You, you reset your nervous system it's, for the day. Exactly. As mm-hmm. long as I got something done physically. Yep. To, to, and you know, and the breathing too, cause yep. I was like, I, I don't like hold my breath underwater like some kid, but I'm like, I practice the breathing, yep. you know, so I'm yep. conscious of how far I can go and back and forth. I and do a lot of theta breath work. I should introduce you to theta breath. Huh? Yeah. It's really cool. It's a, uh, it's, I have, I have a discount That's code. An interesting name. I have a discount code. You get three months free. Theta means spirit. In yeah. Greek. It's a, um, it's named after the brainwave that it taps into when you do it. 
and it really helps you release fear like a lot of fear it'll it'll expose your fears to yourself very quickly yeah it's neuro-linguistic programming uh breath work and meditation all sort of revolving into one sort of like coaching session not, yeah. not a coaching session but it's a it's like an auditory guided meditation yeah and the combination of those three things really helps you get the internal distractions out of the way and really helps oh, you root and tap like into center. like center your chi. Yeah. It yeah. Really helps you tap okay. into things. And it, I, and I think, oh. I think actually now that I'm thinking about it, that as an action in a maintenance phase will actually probably help prevent getting to a relapse phase because it's interesting in the stages of change. Yeah. They say relapse is part of the cycle of change. Yeah. But you know, so I used to say back in the day, um, you know the, the Nautilus symbol? It's like a spiral. Yeah. It's like the most frequently occurring symbol in nature. Yeah. If you flip it like this and then you pull it up from the center, it creates sort of a spiral that oh. goes up, right? Yeah. So I, I used to describe this when I worked in addictions. And it's sort of this, uh, when you're going through stages of change or healing or any kind of process like that, if you're going around the spiral, you're you may relapse in the sense that you have to relearn a lesson. But because mm. if you're paying attention to the lesson in the first place, yeah. that that path around that mountain gets shorter and shorter and shorter at the top, it's right? The, so you learn it faster. Yeah, is it the Fibonacci sequence? Fibonacci sequence, yeah. yeah. They call it, yeah, the Nautilus, Nautilus or the, the Fibonacci sequence. Thanks to Tool, I know about that. Yeah, yes, yeah. The song Lateralis is Call all about back that. to Tool. I like yeah. that Tool's come up so many times. I mean, they talk about uh, shadow work and yeah. Carl Jung theory. Yeah. You know, that, that was like a whole album about it, so. I mean, it, Tool was a healing process for many people in and of itself so guilty as fuck yeah yeah and and they're they're like album uh whatever it's called the discography of deciding whatever yeah but it's like they started out angry and violent and mean and like real mm-hmm. metal and then it just kind of like morphed into what it is today which is like this like almost like orchestra like light very like <laughs> weird mystical <laughs> shit you're like <laughs> You know, like They're metal like, heads. Oh, they were, tapped into their higher yeah. selves. <laughs> Me, but metal heads are like, yeah, fuck that. That's garbage. And I'm like, no, nah, this is fucking amazing. You're like, no, nah, bro, you just didn't evolve. <laughs> yeah, you got to evolve, bro. You evolve. 46 and 2, bro. You got to evolve. <laughs> the metal heads still prefer prison sex. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Three minutes of bang, bang, bang. Yeah. Yeah, not 15 minutes. I just want to be detached from my body. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, yeah. let's go ahead and uh, yes. transition back to the road home with some tools and interventions on how you can use this stuff. All right, welcome to the road home segment. Mike was trying to teach me to say segment, not section. So I'm really trying to force that word out of my mouth. And it's road back, not road home. Road back. I don't know. I don't know any of the words. My, <laughs> my own, own show. And it's I can't remember show. the segment name. I can't. I don't know what they are. It's it's based off Joseph Campbell's journey, oddly enough. And we're talking about journeys today. So, I mean, that's something, right? I, yeah. I probably shouldn't butcher Joseph Campbell's stuff. But I think um, in this segment, <laughs> it's important to to think about what what you can do to really tap into personal growth and yeah. i and you've mentioned so many which is wonderful just by sharing your story i appreciate that you have shared your story and that's i think what people need to hear i think people yeah. are missing that a lot in their lives these days is that they hear a lot of how to's and not a lot of shared experiences yeah and um there's a, a there's this idea of like what it takes to consider personal growth right you think of the personal growth inventory which i have a copy of we can take Mm. we can take it it's nine questions it's Uh a likert scale all right you can take it and rate it and it's a range from nine to 54 and the higher you are on the scale the more inclined or more proclivity you have toward personal growth um so we can take it later if you want okay um but it's one thing to take an assessment right it's one thing to go online i got that off um Positive Psychology, the Positive Psychology Center at UPenn, which is an awesome website, honestly. It's like yeah. a really cool website. Uh, well done, Academia, which you'll never hear me say. I never, I'm never like, yay, Academia, you did a good job, but they did this time. And Martin Seligman is the founder of Positive Psychology, and they came up with the um, personal growth inventory. But 
you can do all those things. You can take those assessments. Like you can, you can diagnose yourself ADHD. You can diagnose yourself with addiction. But yeah. what it actually takes to engage with a personal growth cycle, I think, is starts with considering that there's another way to live. There's yeah. a different lens. Yeah. And I know Mike and I have talked about this too. It's like if you you might not know that you don't feel good. You might not know what it feels like to really feel good in your life because mm-hmm. you're so used to living in your own mind that yeah. you don't consider the fact that there's another way to live, another way to think, another perspective to try on, another thing to embody or experience yeah. physiologically. So I think that that's a really important thing to consider when you're talking about even enter- being in a contemplation stage and contemplating like yeah. maybe my life could change. Yeah. Because I think a lot of what you've shared in your story today really highlights that, right? Like I, I didn't Big know time. what I didn't know until yeah. I started. <laughs> until I dug deep and, yeah. let, and let my feelings out and not like, oh, let, like really just like, why am I like this? Why is this happening? And I've been, to, I've been in the process of the contemplating stage of what is it that I'm running from? Because I've basically been a gypsy for 10 years. But the past year and a half, I've been on the road. I haven't actually had a home. Yeah. You know, I tell people, and I sent this tweet out a while ago. I go, I'm not homeless, but I don't have a home. Yeah. I've like floated. I call it couch surfing through America for the past year. Like, And it's something I decided to do. It was a conscious choice to do that, to say, I'm not going to be stuck in one place. I'm going to go just live wherever and yeah. just literally couch surf and just do my own thing and, and, and make it work. And I did. And yeah. that was part of the, the the retreat I did was it was a reward to myself for actually completing a task. It was like, I did this. Yep. It's like I moved to L.A. to do comedy. I ended up opening up a comedy club and did very well. I was like, I'm successful. <laughs> I was like, oh, I mean, yeah, I wasn't like a billionaire or like, you know, like uh, on all these TV shows. I didn't get a, a, you know, it was on TV shows, but it was like at a different level. Very it different was, forms of success. Yeah, it was all and, kinds. And once again, my twenty-four-year-old niece had to put this in perspective. She's like, "Trevor, you've like accomplished so many things. You're not looking at that." And I had to take a step back. I was like, "Holy shit, I really did." I don't know anybody that moved to LA and opened up a little like pseudo comedy club that had like Joe Rogan and Burt Kreischer there. Yeah, and Whitney. Com- not yeah. the name drop, but like you have to use those people. Yeah. To I mean, give it a reference. Yes. yes. And, mm-hmm. and it, granted, it was LA where it's just like having a celebrity or famous A-list or whatever there all the time is pretty normal. Yeah. But for them to openly say, we love this room too. You've done a great job. Yeah. And I give a lot of that credit, of course, to Sam Tripoli as well because he was my partner. I love Sam you know? Tripoli. Yeah. He's and, so cool. And we, we did something really cool and it was thriving and then COVID killed it. So yeah. it's like we yeah. didn't, you know, we didn't lose the the. The world shut down. Like, I have to remind people, the world shut down. It wasn't yeah. like, oh, yeah, just things aren't going well. It was like, I was, we were fucking kicking ass. Yeah. So A lot I, of people were kicking ass right before the A lot world, of people yeah. were, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like someone stepped in and said, nope. Yeah, you're not yeah. allowed to thrive. Fuck yeah, off. Yeah, and then, yeah. The, the, you know, the biggest upper transfer of wealth in the history of this country happened. Yeah. Yeah, all of a sudden we have trillionaires. Yeah. Insane. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, the, it's another podcast. Yeah. We'll have Sam on for that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Woo! yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, the contemplative thing, like that's where I'm at. Like I was, when I was back home in Chicago land, I was like, am I, I was like, I've been uh, running from um, like not security, but like, like a st- stability. Mm-hmm. I've been running from a stable life my whole life because mm-hmm. I grew up in a very unstable home. Yeah, so that Very was familiar unstable. to you. So yeah. you recreate this the instability yep. to cuz it feels yep. was normal. Yep. All my everyone in my family has a significant other except for me. I'm like I'm freeze bird. I'm out there doing what I want. And you know, my niece brought up that could be a generational curse that you stopped because, you know, everyone it's like that's the process, especially the Midwest. It's like find someone, get married, have a job, have kids or whatever. Yeah. It's like very this is how you're supposed to do things i was like no nah, i think I, yeah i'm just gonna take off to la and uh and be a comic be a black sheep yeah exactly and then do it again and again and again and again you know black sheep tend to be the generational trauma breakers that might be me then because yeah. i definitely did not and i was the first one in my family not to be a plumber my four older brothers were all plumbers and yeah. then it hit me and i was like nope not for me yeah well it's good money i was like not for me 
Yeah. That's it. And then my, it took a long time for my dad to understand that. But when he saw my success after my sobriety mm-hmm. and he made a comment when he was in hospice, he goes, look what you did. You did all this and you didn't even have to drink. Like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> this whole time, you knew that's yeah. what was holding me back. But he didn't say anything. Yeah. Until, well, he, you I mean, know. probably couldn't have. Yeah. And then yeah. a month later, he died. But it was like, you know, that, that moment was like, fuck, dude, you could have told me. That. But I, was, yep. I wouldn't have taken that information well. Yeah. So that's what they say. There's about, always you know, that moment with families like, you should have told me. And they're like, God, yeah, you weren't ready. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I sure wasn't. But yeah, I've, I mean, I've contemplated a lot. And I, I mean, I, there's a part of me that wants to go back to Chicago and stay there for part of me want to stay there forever. So part of me wants to stay there for a while. It's like, cause it's comforting. And it's like, I also miss my family. Yeah. As sad as and fucked up as it sounds. I kind of miss my family. Yeah. You know? That's why I'm here. My niece lives here. Yeah. You know, I love Austin too. You guys are awesome. Like, People I've met here, the comedy family, the little comedy family I have here, but like it's it's comforting too. Yeah, and it's like I I'm uncomfortable for me is comfortable for the average person. Yeah, like I'm out of my comfort zone all the time. That my comfort zone is like would it be having a stable home. Yeah, and like a stable place. Yeah, and that's uncomfortable for me. Yeah, and that's something I realized. I was like, oh, I've been running from my dad for 40 years (laughs) figuratively and literally that's what that was part of something that came out of me was that's it he was a little aggressive and i was i would hide from him i ran away from home all that stuff i was like oh i've been running away from home this whole time and that one pattern dictated your whole life Yep. yep and then he passed away you know like four years ago and it's like then my mom passed away and that's like i don't my parents are gone i can go back home (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's like (laughs) Yeah, but then it's like, oh, I miss them so much. Yeah. At the same time, it's like this, you know, that's very, you know, double edged sword. But you know, I was back then. I, I contemplated that, and I told some friends, I was like, I'm gonna come back for a little bit, but I, I don't. It's just not for me, you know. But I don't know. It's like I'm also like kind of a hopeless romantic at the same time. It's nice that you got that experience with your dad, and then he yeah. had to show you that he saw you. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's in in talking about those generational trauma cycles. I think that people nowadays want the want the win. Like they want to be acknowledged by having a parent say, that's, well, I yep. did this and I caused this in your life. And yeah. that's true, right? Like your dad did cause that whole cycle, that whole pattern in your life. Yeah. But today we like demand that we get that from them, that acknowledgement from them. Yeah. But I think what you got is even better to just be seen. Oh, yeah. By them. 100%. You know, I, I actually had an amazing relationship with my father. It took a while. You know, there's some, you know, I was back and forth all over the country and he didn't like that. But he got to the point where it was like seven years ago. He had a quadruple bypass and I left L.A. and I ended up being his living caregiver for like eight months. Wow. So I was taking care of him, wiping his ass, bathing him, all that stuff, helping him with his diabetes and stuff and helping my mom out a lot, too, because me being there took so much pressure off of her. Yeah. So I did that for about eight months. Um but I, I knew I had to. My yeah. mom didn't want me to because she was like, you're, you're finally in L.A. You're doing your thing. And I was just like, you guys need my help more than, you know, than you're willing to admit. And I did that because I wanted to. I didn't do it for for prosperity. I didn't want people panicking. I didn't do it. Yeah. To, I wasn't like taking pictures of my dad. Like, here I am wiping my dad's out. Look at me. I was just like, I was more like, fuck, this sucks ass. Yeah. Because I was still drinking and doing coke and stuff. So just on the <laughs> weekends. I limited the cocaine to the weekends, by the way. <laughs> but I did enough. Work hard, play hard. <laughs> yeah, I did enough from Friday to Sunday that could fill out Monday to Friday. Yeah. My, microdosing. Just, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just miserable throughout the week. Yeah. 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 yeah so I, I was like, I tell people I was like a college student on the weekends. I yeah. fucking raged. But Well, you were running. You were still running from uh-huh. them. Yeah. And it's interesting because you're the instability, right? It's yeah. the thing that allowed you to be able to show up for them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and your choices, not yep. theirs. And my dad, I remember we were on the, uh, we got a conversation on the phone and he said, he actually said, I'm proud of you. And I was like, man, I know he's going to die soon. Yep. That's the one that gets you <laughs> I was like, time. motherfucker. <laughs> and I remember I sent the tweet out and I just sat there. I was just, my dad just told me he's proud of me. That means he's probably going to die soon. And that was exactly what I said. And I just kind of sat there and got really emotional. I didn't cry. I was just like, fuck. And then it was like, he ended up dying, you know, later that year, but it was like, I got it. There's kids that never get it. 
you yeah. know, yeah. and I got it. And my mom, of course, super supportive, always saying it, you know, there's that, there's this picture. Like, nope. Need it from dad. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's this picture I have on my, it's somewhere on my phone too, but it's a, uh, it's a guy on stage by himself and there's like a cartoon and there's one person in the audience and it's his mom and it's like a comic. And yep. it's like, you know, your mom's always going to be your biggest supporter, your biggest fan or whatever. And she was she totally cliche. My mom has always been my biggest fan, my first yeah. fan, my biggest supporter. Yeah. yeah, that's that's the thing for, I think, um, mothers and sons and then fathers and daughters. Yeah, it goes the other way. For fathers yeah. and daughters, which is funny because like there's always that stigma of like, oh, daddy issues. But it's not daddy issues. It's mommy issues. Yeah, it with is. daughters. Yeah, that's what it is. It definitely is. I yep. agree with that. Yep. Yeah, because my dad would be the one in the audience. Yeah, <laughs> my mom's proud of me, too. She supports me, too. Yeah. My dad would be their front row. Like that would be the my, my dad saw me do comedy when I was 27, 28. And he was just shaking his head. <laughs> <laughs> Like, that's not mine. Oh, I got a lot of that. He's like, I want to return life. that What one. are you doing? <laughs> He's like, what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, you know, a lot of dirty dick jokes and whatnot, but. Like, it's know. generational. It's just like your niece showing up. Yeah. You know? and, and that's what, Gen Z? She's Gen Z? She's Gen, Gen Z. Z. She's 24. Gen Z, but she's like, I'm really a millennial. I'm like, no, Gen Z. Now everybody are... wants to be a millennial. Millennials so, you know. suck. Gen Z's are better, I think. I think Gen Z's are a phenomenal, I think but way for better. some reason, everybody just wants to be. There was a joke the other day. They were like, Joe Biden's a millennial. <laughs> Like, it just like is three like of a, them yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I love Gen Z though. Yeah. But like all these other generations paved the way for that, I think. Yeah. And then Gen Z really took all that and like action stage, ran with yeah. it, right? Gen I think, Z was like, we have the answers. We're going to yeah. rock it. Brett Ernst has a great bit about yes. boomers, Gen X, Gen, or Gen yes. Zers. It's fucking oh, yeah, I know. so good. <laughs> oh my God. He's another one we have to have on. I yeah. love, I'll have you, Brett, and Sam all in one episode. That'd be amazing. <laughs> There's going to be a fight. <laughs> I'll tell you who's going to lose, but I don't know who's going to (laughs) win. It's the craziest green room ever. That would be a blast. Yeah, Yeah. that would be hilarious. Jesus. But no, I think that sharing your story has been really beneficial and powerful for the people that are going to listen in because um, personal growth journeys are... Are, are a thing now they're yeah, a trend now they are but also i think at the core of it the the takeaway message and the, and the really the thing that you can engage with in your own life is is not running from your feelings yeah right like once you have the capacity to sit with how you actually feel mm-hmm. and work through that no matter how scary it is or overwhelming it might feel that's the thing yeah that gets you to take flight in that journey right that's the thing that gets the plane off the ground and flying yeah and that's the thing that we avoid with substances, with porn, with yeah. um, just avoid, just general avoidance, right? Yeah. Like when you, when you ask somebody how they feel or what they're thinking, they're like, I don't know. Yeah. And you're like, well, why? Sit, figure it out. Let, yeah. it come, let it come up. Yeah. Let it come up. Yeah. Theta breath is a really good tool for that. I'll, I'll have to introduce yeah. you to that. Um, but some of the other things like the TRE, right? Like TRE and the exposure therapy. Exposure and therapy. And meditation. Like, uh, and I do meditating and praying together. Yeah. And like I said, praying isn't like, like going to church and being like, here you go. Here's five dollars. Can I and- <laughs> Yeah, can I eat this wafer? No. It's like praying is like you talk to yourself. Yeah. You can be praying. You can, you know, I pray to Mother Nature. Yeah. because we rent this bitch from her. We don't own shit. That was the number one thing I used to say in <laughs> yeah. addictions when people had a hard time with the higher power piece, right? Yeah. Is that like, okay, if you, you believe nature exists, right? Yeah. Like you can go outside and touch a tree. Yeah. You, no human created, you know, the, the photosynthesis pro- yeah. system in, in a tree, right? Like yeah. nobody created that. There's something bigger than you that we had to learn about as humans yep. That's that we have no control over. Yeah. And I think that's the piece, right? Because when we think we have a ton of control over our own life, we put a ton of pressure and responsibility on yep. ourselves. And then that shame barometer gets yeah. completely out of whack. And then yeah. we self-sabotage and we're in self-contempt. And it, you have to have a spirituality you have to know that there is so much there's something more there's something else yeah, yeah so you can much call more. it god you can call it Allah. you can call it xena you can call it whatever you want but there's something else out there you there's can call it energy. science you yeah. can call it yeah. exactly there's an energy force that's greater than us that yeah. that, that you know I'm, I'm a big fan of always been a big fan of energy push and pull yeah and learning it more and more about myself. And I was just like, I'm attracted to certain people more and less to certain people. And I was like, what is the energy pull? Yeah. It's like, and it's like, oh, 
you know, and then you bring up, then people say, oh, it's past life stuff or whatever. They, they but they intersect their beliefs into it. And it's just like, I don't know. I'm like, I'm very like, open. This is what it is. I'm right. Yeah. <laughs> I know the well, answer. Like, there's like 3,000 religions. It's like, yeah, uh, why don't we know, detach from knowing the answer? Yeah. You don't have to be right all the time. Yeah. I just, I just, I'm more like, I feel shit now, yeah. you know, especially after what happened recently, even before that, but that really broke. Uh, what happened recently really broke open the social constructs what we yeah. talked about yeah. and and like how i look at women is completely different yep like i look i mean i'm still like that she's hot but i'm also like it's not like i just want to fuck her i'm like oh, i would maybe get to know her yeah you know now it's like usually it's just human. like yeah get drunk and sit my dick in her like that's so yep. much more fun and easier yep. but it's like now it's i'm also older it's different, you know, it's like I, I've had a lot of fun and I just I'd rather have something more meaningful with yeah. somebody that rather than just. And that's know. such an important conversation because I think that's where the conversation needs to start. Right. If yeah. you're talking about wrestling with your nervous system, a lot of the things, yeah. a lot of the divisiveness we see, a lot of the misguided um actions taken by men and women yeah right a lot of that is rooted in people's inability to sit with those feelings to connect yep. on a deeper level and it's because you're in that reactive state you're in a state of reactivity because your nervous system is there to keep you safe yeah and you're in that reactive state creating division between you and another person yeah that reactivity is meant to fight or escape it's not meant to connect your parasympathetic nervous system is good for connecting, hmm. right? To be at yeah. peace and calm with somebody. Yeah. And and you don't get that with porn. You don't get that with, hmm. you know, just getting drunk and hooking up. And yeah. and the conversation really needs to change. We had to do a whole other podcast episode on that. But the conversation needs to change around like sex and sexual health and yeah. and how we relate to one another as sexual beings as well. Yeah. That's a really important, and, and that energy piece, right? Because the other thing that you're talking about with the energy piece is that I got caught a long time ago in that good vibes only, yeah, you know, like yeah. I was like, ah, good vibes only. Like, yeah. and I still have a lot of like shirt t-shirts that yeah. say it and stuff. And it's yeah. like, ah, but you know, I learned recently that all energy is energy. Yeah. And you know, it's whether true. it's good or bad, you can't, you can't just select the energy. You can't just choose to have good vibes only. Yeah. If you're cutting yourself off from experiencing the best vibes and the bad ones. Mm -hmm. And you need to be able to, some of those feelings, right? Those, those deeper, darker, more harder, more difficult feelings, whether it's, whether it's talking about sexuality in connection with another person or vulnerability or, you know, some of those softer feelings or some of the more difficult ones to wrestle with, that can feel like negative energy. Yeah. And if somebody's showing up with negative energy, like, or somebody's showing up like feeling erratic or their energy's off, like that's them in their reactive nervous system. Yeah. And if you're resistant to that, it just creates all this divisiveness, yeah. you know, talking about creating that socioeconomic gap after COVID, mm -hmm. that divisiveness drives that gap because people can't relate to each other anymore. People are scared of each other. They're reactive around and each that's other. that's exactly what happened. And yeah. then we can't communicate. We can't have good conversations. We yeah. can't have shared experiences and share our stories and connect and learn from one another. And that's, I think that fucked, I mean, a lot of people relapsed. A ton of people relapsed. Yeah. And people that were drinking moderately or using or smoke, whatever, it everything just amped up everybody me i don't know how or why i was like oh shit later i was like i went on road trips i was f like the only person flying like i don't give a shit <laughs> it's like if i die i die yeah. i was in wisconsin chicago i took a road trip like yeah i was at the beach all the time i went to malibu i went for drives i, I took advantage i saw the silver lining and i'm like I don't have to be stuck at the club six, seven days a week for six to 15 hours. I'm like, I'm going to go do what I'm going to do. I'm and free. It, and the government's <laughs> going to pay me. <laughs> yeah. They're going to pay me twice, the, yeah. the state and federal. I was like, I took, I did so many different, I went to the Grand Canyon. I went on a road trip through Arizona. I was like, did all this stuff. Yeah. I was like, I love this. And that's a, that's another thing about engagement in your own life and a personal growth journey. If you didn't learn about your own nervous system reactions during covid then you weren't paying attention yeah you, that's with yeah. prime time figuring out like yeah. what do i do in a crisis how do i respond to a crisis a flight <laughs> i took flight. It off literal flights yeah i was like <laughs> yeah flights. i yep. was like boom and then i get back to la and i was like oh everything's a fucking shit show so i took a yep. road trip to the grand canyon yep i was gone for six seven days yeah and, and one all through arizona all the places i love and i was like i'm gonna do this and when you're looking for your people in life, like when you're looking for your tribe or your squad or whatever, oh, that, yeah. you're looking for somebody that matches your nervous system. You're yeah. looking for somebody that's going to end up playing with you. Yeah. Right? Like our, our, I think our vibe was probably fight mode. 
Yeah. And we were with a bunch of other people that fought, like, were yeah. in fight mode, you know? And, like, that's when, when you're looking for your people, that's why friendships and, and relationships tend to have similar generational trauma or similar trauma wounds yeah. from their past because yep. they can, they're like, oh, I can relate. And it's because you guys, you make sense to one another because you're nervous, you have the same nervous system. Patterns. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I was, yeah, that's my best friend. He, we, we get along so well because we have similar upbringings. Yep. Aggressive father, immigrant father. Yep. submissive mother can do no wrong was very sweet and probably an enabler too for him or yeah. his family definitely in my family so it's yeah. like you know that that balance is there yeah and, and you know and he's become more emotionally available i'm way more emotionally available than i've ever been so and it's weird because guys my age that's my thing is my focus is really on men because i'm a man yeah that's what i can speak for i'm not yeah. going to speak for women yeah and men around my age, a little bit younger and definitely older, are not. We're never allowed to be this way, and yep. that's why I'm saying it's okay. And yep. I've had some dudes like you know DM me and stuff, and they're they're like they're cool about it. They're just like they kind of like, like almost question like what's going on with you. And I'm like, so I am, man. Like, this is this, who I am. Is this real? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like yeah, it's real yeah. as fuck, you know. Yeah. And and like it's it's okay, you know. And I tell dude, you know, friends, I was like. You don't have to go. You don't have to cry in camera. Go in the shower. Go in the bathroom. Yeah, yeah. You know, or go in the car. Yeah. Love the good cry in the car. Yeah, yeah. Shower and car. Crying, yeah, crying, I've been crying. On the, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. crying. In, I used to say crying in the showers and crying in the car, or vice versa. Yeah, it's like because <laughs> yeah. I've been on the road a lot and in my car a lot lately. So yeah, that's where I get a lot done. Yeah, and I really think about my life and you know I was like oh, and I enjoy it. I love road trips. I've been hooked on them since I was a little kid. I'm, yeah, I'm a big fan. I was like, I could, I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm like, then I drove out here from LA. I'm like, man, that was fun. Was fun. Yeah. I was like, I don't know if I ever want a home again. <laughs> Fuck this. Well, I'm certainly and, glad you came. Yeah. And I'm glad you're here for a couple weeks this yes, summer. Absolutely. And yeah. I always love when you come in town and I really appreciate you coming in and sharing your story and giving people time. permission to yeah. feel their feelings and be on a personal growth yeah. journey, no matter what yeah. that looks like. So fucking a. thanks for coming in. You got it. Hey, yeah. plug those socials one more time so yeah. people can actually uh, follow you. Yeah. All yes. Of them. Plug yes. Them all. Uh, <laughs> you can find me at Trevor Kevlo. That's T R E V like Victor O R Kevlo K E V like Victor E L O H. That's Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And then my new Instagram page, which which is about my recovery journey is Trevor on Trevor. And then my comedy brand, Corrupted Comedy, it's corrupted with a K, comedy with a C. All right. We'll yeah. throw all those in the episode description for you, too. Yeah, yeah. All right. Cool. We'll see you next time. If you're having a mental health emergency, we urge you to dial the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255 or text the Crisis Text Line. Text HOME to 741-741.